guys ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Action! My name is Jeff Warren Meach. I directed and edited Macbeth 3000. Hi, my name is Dennis Logan, and I play Macduff in uh, Macbeth 3000. When I wrote the script, I didn't have any idea what uh, characters were. <laughs> and anyway, <laughs> Bill really... <laughs> Bill... <laughs> Put your glasses on, man. Sometimes when you get two very nice and very, very delicious Valencia oranges, and you peel them and you eat them two at the same time. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> I, was go I was going there. So what I was going to say before I was interrupted was that um, Macbeth is a lot like eating two oranges. <laughs> if those oranges are followed by the number 1500. <laughs> <laughs> Can I see that again? <laughs> so I'm Bill. Just shut up. Hey, this is uh, Harmi Bindra. I did the music and the audio and many other things from Macbeth 3000 and this documentary you're watching right now. Hope you enjoy. It is nice. I like. My name is Matthew Snowball. I played Witch number three, I believe. How's it going? I'm Mike Venner. I did stunt and uh, special effects and stunt driving on the movie. Uh, I also lent my house for a lot of the shooting of it. My name? Chris Felborn. What did I do? Hey Chris, are you going to Burbank? Uh, no! <laughs> well, but do you think it would be the dude to do if I was going to there? Ah! It's called Macbeth 3000 because that's a really cool name. I'm sorry I can't reveal my identity to you. Uh, I I'm afraid that uh, my enemies out there are numerous, and if they were to ever learn my true identity, I'd receive a series of mildly upset emails, and I have no junk filter. My name is Ben Davis. I played Steve in Macbeth 3000. This time it's personal. My name is Chad Holmes, and I played Steve Jr. in Macbeth 3000. My name is Jason Laughman. I play many roles. Well, my name is James Dougherty. I played the part of Super Dave in the movie Macbeth 3000. Oh, well, my name is Paul Bindra. I am the executive producer, and I am Hermit Bindra's father, who was the music composer of the movie. He always pushed us. And I think without his, without him being there and pushing us, because we almost gave up on the film in 2004, beginning of the summer. And without his, you know, without his, his, his talks that he gave to all of us, we probably wouldn't have carried on. The actual production company, they did, um, what was it, Hamlet? <laughs> they did King Lear. And I watched King Lear, and it was the funniest shit at the time. I tell you, we're hearing Spock go die. That made me laugh. Spock. I believe that Starfleet will have to be notified that our rendezvous with the starship Potemkin will not take place as scheduled. And they were also in the process of doing a couple other movies. They started off with a movie called The Future. Okay, that's that's good. I'm not good with the, this movie. It's called The Future. It could be shit. It could be good. It could be brilliant. I have no clue. I haven't seen it. Um, but. These guys have approached me in a parking lot and paid me to tell you to watch it. Is there already a name, a film name to the, the future? Most likely, yeah. Probably. So you guys are just completely lacking actually, originality. Well, actually, ours is called. A it's lot called, of blues 20s. It's called the future, the horrible, horrible future. So it's more. The horrible, like, horrible future. Yeah. It's more of a pessimistic view of society. That's never been done before. It's about two cops who time just travel. Whip, whipping a dead. Two cops who time travel. They get hit. That's in the head. never been done before. They get, they get hit in the head. They get hit in the head with a radioactive clock. Okay, you've never... This has I'm been done before. Why don't you guys do like an original take on Dante's Inferno, dress some dudes up in rat suits or something, and do something interesting for Actually, our next project's King Lear. Is it? Yeah. We, don't, we did we've Hamlet We've done already. Hamlet. 
You've done Hamlet. Yeah. yeah. It ends with a lightsaber battle, but that's just, you know. <laughs> It's okay, it's okay, it's okay. I'm a cop. Yeah, but that, that movie just never materialized. There was this thing, Chris got injured when he got hit by a car or something, so that halted production. Oh, shit! Definitely. I'd definitely do it again. And so time passed, and then we did Macbeth. And so I just thought, hmm, I would like to get into this. Well, so I get the call from Jeff Meech. And he says, he has this amazing role for me. And it turns out I'm just the drunk security clerk in the White House. Well, I says to Jeff, you're the drunk security guard. And then they posted this thing like, oh, if you want to be in Macbeth 3000, come to the come to the shit where we di dictate and so I came there and I saw them and I was just like I would like to be in your movie so I wrote down my name my email my number and they just called me I was like damn damn sir the two armies are converging 200 yards from here they showed me a whole new world like all just the techniques and stuff that they did like they were smart people what is Macbeth 3,000. Okay. What is it? I make little Macbeths every morning before breakfast. <laughs> no! <laughs> Drop them off at the pool if you know what I'm saying. M for Macbeth. A for action. C for comedy. B for bonanza. E for... Elephant. T for testosterone and H. For homosexual. In Macbeth, uh, we had Ronnie and Steph and uh, uh, Shona and uh, Kate. Those are four girls and. Um, Really, uh, really they all died. <laughs> Except for Ronnie, who never existed in the first place. Like all girls should. One of my best memories from the movie would have to be when we were at, uh, Mike Venner's house during, uh, March break back in high school. I suppose my favorite memory from making the film would have to be just, uh, that whole March break spent at Mike Venner's house filming the, uh, climactic lightsaber battle for scene 17. I had a lot of fun that week. It was a good time taking apart the guy's house and uh, doing stuff in there during that time. My favorite memory from making in the movie. Ooh, I liked the part where um, we stringed up this like bottle rocket from Venner's house, like inside the window to outside, and when it shot off, it was a piece of shit. Yeah, in the Sidewinder missile, I remember that. Um, it was, we, we were trying to shoot, uh, it was a scene when Macbeth was trying to shoot McDuff with the rocket launcher, which was actually a potato cannon. Holy shit! Harmony was like, all right, we're going to do this missile thing today. It's going to be amazing. He was so pumped. Everybody was so excited because that window jump went perfectly. Yeah, better! Holy fuck! The most embarrassing part of doing anything is having something go wrong when you explain to somebody for like two hours that it's gonna work. What's gonna happen is it's gonna be but on a light rod. It's gonna be on a light stand. It's gonna be holding the light stand. I need someone to hold the light stand. Bill's gonna be standing here like this, okay? The two he's, uh, he's trying to explain it to everybody, what's going on and what's gonna happen. But I knew what was gonna happen. And, and I said, we better cover our faces because we're going to get burned. We're using a bottle of okay. three engine cartridges. It's, it's going to shoot down. Holy it shoots fire. down. Blow no, sky. After high. it shoots down, it'll stop. Nothing, it's nothing it's will happen. Metal. All the sparks. What? We got to protect Bill's face. Yes. Yes. Jump out of the way. Yes, that's, that's true. <laughs> okay, yo, Bobby, please. No, no, no. no, no, no. <laughs> The only problem was is that I added like, I put like six different types of rockets in there thinking, that, you know, more power, it'll, the faster it'll go. Oh god, it went nowhere. It went nowhere. <laughs> it 
it kind of didn't do anything. He says, hold on, hold on. And then the thing rips out the window. <laughs> I guess it was too much power for the string. It's just spinning around and around. And I, and I love the shot. Dennis is waiting to go because he's waiting for it to come down. Yeah, Dennis is just standing there, you know, waiting for it. It's going like this fast. It went down the court. Dennis fell while trying to get away from it. <laughs> Bo! Bo! <laughs> I told Jeff, I'm like, we can still use it if we speed it up. So we sp I sped it up, I showed it to him, uh, you know, on, on the premiere. It looked beautiful. I hope Harmie wasn't too disappointed about that. Oh. So here we are at the set of Macbeth 3000. This time it's personal on the, on the inventor's backyard during the March break. It's uh, the Wednesday of the March break and we're here uh, in the backyard preparing for Jeff's window jump. Jeff will be stunt doubling myself as he goes through a second story window out onto the snow, uh, which he's putting notches down through uh, a bunch of fake glass, which is still sharp, so don't try this at home. It is done by a highly trained professional in controlled conditions. He's fucked. For the window jump, um, if you go online, you can search breakaway glass or sugar glass, and you'll get a ton of recipes involving sugar, water, and corn syrup. And what you do is you just cook this stuff all together with a candy thermometer. You pour it out at the right temperature into like a cookie tray. And then you let it let it dry, let it cool. And that stuff's very fragile. Um, uh, depending how you make it, it will look like glass. It will physically react like glass. It will sound like glass. But the bonus is that you can also eat it because it's sugar. <laughs> It was one of the one of my biggest dreams. One of the things I've been waiting to do for so long is to jump through a window. Uh, I know it sounds crazy, but it's the kind of guy I am. I don't know. I remember. Uh watching a video a long time ago at Jeff's house. He showed me him, he, he, he jumped off this giant cliff and into this huge, I don't know, like quarry of water. And it was friggin' amazing and I wanted to do something there. And I remember talking to him about it. I'm like, Jeff, we, we, gotta, we gotta do something there. He wanted to do it as well. And he, you know, he, in his mind, he had always set up this last sequence in the movie to happen on this cliff. I don't know, I think my favorite part of the movie is the, the, the cliff scene. It's amazing how that was that was people's favorite scene because it took us like two days to do it. I mean, we were there and we did it and we were done and I couldn't believe how how easy it was. There he is. Uh, but everyone worked their ass off that day. It was amazing. Uh, that was a really good day on the shoot. Oh, wasn't it wonderful? Yeah. Way that back now? in the day. Come on. That was one of the biggest scenes in the movie and it only took us a day to shoot. And Jeff choreographed the fight the day before. We made the dummy, Harmi painted the face on it, which looked really good, which looked really good. And the fight sequence turned out way better than I could have ever hoped. Some Jet Li stuff. Wow! I thought the stunts in that were very well done. Like, I know that they were both stunt doubles for that. Not that you could tell in the film. For, for most of the movie, I doubled McDuff, which was played by Dennis Logan. You know, tried to, tried to mimic his movements. You know, those, those, those lanky punches that he throws. <laughs> lanky punch. Oh. Get the headlock. That's not a headlock. That's lanky punch. Run at him. Run at him. Run at him. No, not like. Oh, I got dust in my eyes. Oh my god, you guys made it look like you were on real cliffs. And we did a really good job at making it look like that with green screen technology. There was a lot of danger in this movie, and um, with, with danger comes real, real responsibility. 
and um, the values that you carry with such responsibility are really important. And uh, I don't think our values were in check, but it looked good, so we uh, we kept doing it. Come back. Ah! Okay, 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 and uh, we wrapped that up with newspaper, stuck clothes over it, and I stuck, uh, I stuck a hose pipe up the spine and up to the neck. We're here um, at the cliff, and uh, we're filming a final scene in what will be the movie Macbeth 3000. Basically, this entails uh, a fight between myself and Macbeth to the death, which is, I'm not going to spoil the ending to you, but let's just say it's excellent. <laughs> As soon as this, the, the axe came around and swung the head off, uh, Mike was holding up the dummy, and I was behind, you know, with my mouth on the hose, and and uh, I blew as hard as I could, and everything just erupted everywhere, all over Dennis's face, and uh, it, it, it was a beautiful shot. It was a money shot at its best. Three. Yes. That was actually uh, two separate effects. One was actually actual physical dummy head being cut off. Uh, the other was a digital. I cut Bill's head off digitally and bring it towards the camera and then cut quickly to the dummy head being chopped off. And with the sound effect, with the music, with everything put together, is seamless. I'm still pregnant. How did you even survive? And then you realize that some kid on a video fooled you. And you want nothing more than to take sweet revenge. Throughout the film, Leonard was our main dummy. My name is Leonard, and I'm about to become a stuntman. I remember Leonard. Leonard was a good guy. Leonard was my buddy. I'm on his way there somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> Over time, he kind of got destroyed. His last, his last scene in the movie was when he got pummeled by the uh, Fifth Avenue, which we purchased for the sequence where Super Dave gets hit by a car during the car chase. That was a dummy, and uh, he died. Leonard died that day. Dennis was driving it against my best, you know, interest. Dennis was driving it, and uh, of course he hit Super Dave really, really, really hard. And then it, he kind of jumped it over into the snowbank, and he couldn't reverse it out the snowbank because the tires were so bald from me sneaking in and doing burnouts in it. We were freaking out one because the cops were on us hard earlier that day, and we it was our last day to shoot with this car, so we had to get that shot. I'm sorry, I gotta film this. So. It, we had to, I had to take my dad's van, drive it home, and then get a rope, and then drive back. <laughs> Let's go snap this. Shit, there's nothing to latch it to. Find something. Axel, I don't care. Go. Super dead. <laughs> I can't get his leg. <laughs> <laughs> Get out of here! Hey. Oh, this is fucking stupid. <laughs> I knew something bad was gonna happen. That's sweet. Thanks to my quick thinking, <laughs> I got stuck in the snow, man. Actually, pretty much anything that really exciting, fun, and cool happened was when Mike was around. He, he worked his ass off, just like anybody else came up with some amazing ideas. Like, who would have thought, like, putting a flame, I'm not gonna get into that. Now pay attention, 69. We've made a few modifications to your car. Okay, well, right now, I'm just selling it because I broke down. Um, 
all the work that I put into it really helped with all of the, uh, the special effects. Um, I mean, uh, like learning how to drift, learning how to do the power slides, learning how to do the donuts and driving backwards. It's a, a don't try it in your car unless you've done it, unless you know what you're doing, because you'll really mess your car up. And I learned the hard way. I, I broke. What was it? I, I went through countless brake pads. I broke two suspension links in the back. I ruined my clutch. Um, but it was it was all, all it was all worth it. I mean, when I look back at it and I see a dent on it, I know what that dent came from. I mean, it's like a record. I was driving the car at the time, and I was going, you know, the, the, the key to the shot was hit the phone booth really fast. So I was doing probably 80 to 100 when I hit this phone booth, and it was made out of real phone booth doors. So we hit it and naturally smashed the windshield of the car. So we, we were kind of panicking on what to do with the car. We were driving back with our unregistered, unplated, uninsured car. Well, the plan was to drive it right back to the school. And Mike decided to take a little shortcut, and in the process of doing that, hopped the curb, spun the tires, and there was a cop sitting right there. So naturally, I put the pedal to the floor and kind of take off, and, and this, is running on, this is running on one spare tire, too. So we kind of had our own little chase going, where Mike went one way and I went the other, and uh, Lucky enough, the cop followed me and Mike got away and I soon found him and we kind of just hung out for a while. Mom, Dad, don't worry about it. Um, now, I guess Phil was really gung-ho to do the, the stunt and I was driving because I've hit people before when I'm driving. Phil did never never did this before, so Phil was all about getting, you know, giving it a try for the first time. So I'm getting close to him, and I'm doing about 40 kilometers an hour, like Jeff asked me to. And I guess Jeff was Jeff, the scene was Jeff was supposed to run across the front to be McDuff, and um, Phil was Macbeth, and Phil was gonna roll up. So Jeff ran by, and I guess I was going a little quicker than he anticipated, so he clipped his back ankle, so he fell out, fell over under the grass, which worked out for the shot. But Phil jumped, and and when he jumped, the car the car kind of propelled him up onto the windshield. It's, fixed, um, it's funny in such a sad way. Dennis drove around for I think it was four or five days with a broken windshield, which probably leads to why the SWAT team came to school. That was the first major problem we ran into with the movie. Like, the windshield breaking, I couldn't believe how, how... That, that was the first thing that really got us. Like, oh my god, we broke a windshield. We're, we're, that's not good. Anyway, so he uh, smashed my windshield up, and then uh, I had to get hit by the car, and it kind of hit kind of hard, and my knees kind of buckled, and I fell on the windshield and hit my nose in the center of the uh, spiderweb crack. Okay, Dennis, you looking that way? Turn. Go, Ben. Oh, that was awesome. It's a good day. Very good day. I was always amazed at the, the workshops and the brainstorming they did around, you know, things like designing equipment to make explosions or the, the water stuff that they did. Um, but. Uh, the innovative ideas that they had was very impressive because I think it showed the ingenuity of what can happen when boys come together in, with a committed um, view on things and the, the ingenuity was very smart. Mike, why don't you talk to, uh, talk to us about the precautions that we're going through to make sure this doesn't explode in our face. <laughs> we threw a rug over it. <laughs> Dude, what? <laughs> die, die, don't laugh, die. When we first scouted out the locations, yeah, we had these cool, we, first we wanted, all we wanted to know is we wanted to blow stuff up, but then when we went back to our meets, we had a meeting with Mike, Jeff, and our meet, and we were like, okay, we want to blow stuff up, but we hadn't figured out how to do this. You know, I wanted real explosions. We had a lot of digital explosions in the film, but, you know, as, as Jeff is an admirer of getting blown up and getting set on fire, he is an admirer of good, high, big-ass explosions. Oh, 
one of the best things. The explosions. Like every five minutes I saw something blow up and I just like, damn, I like that. I got together with Mike Venner who helped a lot with the special effects. Mike Venner and Harmeet Bindra were real, uh, you know, techie whizzes throwing stuff together. When we needed to do explosions, they took a design from a potato can and they learned in science class. If you ask me what I learned in college, it was how to blow up gasoline. My favorite memory of working on the film was probably the explosions, that the ones that worked. Uh, the first explosions we did, we attempted where we, we took, you know, we took rocket engines that you see model rockets. We took the black powder out, put it in the steel pipes, and we had uh, gasoline filled in condoms. We put that over top of it, and then we had an igniter underneath it. We're not supposed to be filming this. I know. This is for the trial. <laughs> A brown man making bombs. Mommy, why are you doing this? Where? What's, writ Jeff. what's written on his t-shirt? It looks like some sort of... Oh, there's a fire extinguisher. Oh, Sweet. We worked for a long time working on uh, ways to make, you know, a catalyst for the explosion. We tried doing, like, sacks of gasoline. That sucks. Oh, come on! We tried a, um, uh, making our own, you know, gunpowder, which worked, but we wasn't any, wasn't at all useful. Ah! Finally, we uh, came up with the idea of having a big tube with like a, 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 a butane torch on the top and then a little piece at the bottom that was pointed up and a long tube that was filled with gasoline. And into a, a, a tube, a plastic, <laughs> I almost puked in my mouth. And we pressurized this big cylinder of PVC and when we wanted it, we'd light the, uh, we'd light the, uh, the, the propane torch and when Jeff called for uh, you know the explosion. We crack it open, and this it would spray the gasoline past the the, the butane torch, kind of like a fuel injector in a car. And it was really cool how it worked out. I remember the first time we did it, it was me and Harmeet trying to figure it out, and we got this amazing explosion, and we couldn't believe how good it was. Then I remember we were so excited. We went over to Jeff's house, woke him up, and brought him over. The second time we tried it, it didn't light at all. We got covered in gasoline. <laughs> the explosions that Mike and Harmi did were just unbelievable. Originally we had shot this battle sequence, which is just horrible. Act, dude, act! <laughs> Guys, oh, yeah, I think we're coming. Hopefully it doesn't make it onto the DVD, but if it does, you'll know why we had to re reshoot it. We ended up going to this river, and uh, we ended up lighting off an insane amount of fireball explosions. And the uh, safest place to do the fire stuff, I figured, was in a river. We're surrounded by water, we go somewhere isolated in a valley, we're not gonna get in trouble, even though apparently the cops did come. Uh, we still were able to let loose at least 40 fireballs in the air, plus the water explosions. You could run through them, you could dive through them, you could do whatever the hell you wanted through them. And because we had uh, a gas-powered air compressor right next to us, we, we had 50, 60 to 100 going off. And we just had dozens of explosions going off all the time. It was beautiful. And nothing could have gone wrong that day. Everything was just perfect. This PVC uh, tubing actually has holes drilled in probably every three to four inches. And this would be submerged in water. And what would happen is, is that we would release the air of this tube and the fireball tube at the same time and what would look what it would look like was a gush of water coming up and behind it a flame coming up so you know simulating uh, explosions in the water One shot where the fireball is at least 50 feet in the air. It goes out of frame, you can't see it. And then you get this huge smoke ring going off in the sky.
podcast. <laughs> I'm surprised there weren't any actual serious injuries during the filming of this movie. And not to mention the whole SWAT team coming to the school was a little bit uh, scary. Um, what are you doing here? And then I said, we're looking for spots to film our movie. And then he says, um, let me see, let me see your IDs. And we gave him our IDs. And uh, he says, yeah, we're, um, we're with the Port Authority, the Hamilton Port Authority. The canine units. About 14 cops. I wasn't actually in the presence of the SWAT team. Countless security guards. I think I speak on behalf of everyone in the film by saying uh, we'd like to thank the uh, Peel and Halton Regional Police for not arresting us. Several times. Did you call the division <laughs> at all to tell them that you're doing this? Are you the same group I came across before in the woods? Probably all over here. Probably. Why are you guys out this late? Whose car is that? What's what's all the smoke for? I mean, lots of lots of stuff that I'm sure they ask on a regular basis. But I mean, we heard it a lot. Everything was repeated. Well, what are you doing here? Do you have a permit for that? Um, you know, where did you get that? <laughs> Can I see it? <laughs> when I talk about the SWAT team, I sometimes yammer on. To be honest, I'm, I'm surprised none of them got arrested. It was myself, Bill, Dennis, Jeff. That's it. So, Dennis's windshield is broken. Um, continuity isn't our strongest point in the film, if you'll notice. Really, for the most part, I think that the uh, continuity in the film really outshines even the uh, brightest stars. But we knew that there's a few shots we had to get before Dennis got his windshield fixed. We are just doing our normal thing. We'd done it in the industrial park dozens of times. So it's lunch hour at our high school. Um, we go out, drive around, uh, get some shots of me jumping off the roof of the car with a gun, get shots of Dennis on top of the hood, swerving, you know, almost falling off. So he goes and jumps off the car with a gun, and then there's a security car guy, sorry, there's a security guy with a notepad, and he comes out, and so one thing leads to another. We zoom out into opposing traffic, dodge a few cars, end up back at the school. We were running a little bit late, so I had to run off to class, and uh, the other guys had no class next period. We're unpacking our stuff out of the car, and all of a sudden about 14 cops and about eight cars, a canine unit, pull into the uh, the parking lot behind Arendelle where we're, we're all at. People pile out of the back of the trucks, and they they start putting it, telling them to get up against the truck, get up against their car, and they're, ho they're holding their hands in like guns, like they're gonna pull it out and shoot them. Put your hands on the hood, on the hood. And we're freaking out, we're like, oh crap. Not only are the cops on us, which has happened before, but they're at our school. <laughs> and this huge crowd starts forming and all these cops get out and they start pointing their guns and shotguns at us. They got their machine guns, their shotguns, and Dennis and Jeff were standing right there and they're like pinned up against the car. You know, Jeff and I are against the hood of the car. Bill's kind of just off to the side. According to Jeff, like Bill's trying to itch away, but then Bill got caught too. I came around the corner and all I see is Bill getting frisked, which is really funny. Never have I been patted down so thoroughly. Well, maybe twice I've been pat patted down that thoroughly. Okay, so so I had been patted down that thoroughly before. That's beside the point. But the real point of it was that I did not know that she was 17. Boom, pushed me back down the hood. They're going through Dennis's car with the broken windshield. They start pulling out things, and first they pull out, you know, a dummy, Leonard, and, and uh, fucking then, um, oh yeah, they pull out the fake guns and the fake lightsabers, and then they start pulling out some Iraqi flags, and uh, <laughs> that, that was funny. And they were all on the ground with all the guns in their faces, and not their faces. Was it in your face? I don't understand what's going on. And then our principal comes out. This is after SWAT, the canine units, rest police officers has shown up which isn't a very long try since there's a cop station right across from our school. And I'm just sitting up in the third floor laughing my ass off. It's like, if I was there an extra two minutes, I would have been right there with them. But uh, our good old principal, Mr. Shaw, came out. Takes one look at us on the hood of the cop car and just starts laughing. So he explains everything to the cops. Um, we get a warning. We always got warnings. I don't even know how many warnings we had. But uh, they just apologized and they were on their way, but uh, caused quite a little scene there for a while. It was uh, it was really quite funny. It just boggles my mind as to 
how we didn't get in more shit than what we actually did for making this movie. And you know, it just feels like uh, like me and the uh, me and the Japanese hooker again. Um, she may be Japanese, but um, she's still a hooker. She's she's still a hooker. I swear to God, Bill did not know that girl was 17. I was with him. I can back it up. Well, basically, we were running short on locations to film or like, because, you know, we were just filming all around Mississauga and it was like, okay, the same stuff. It's hard to find places. And then uh, my dad offered basically to let us use the weekend to film at the office, which is a, like a nice professional looking office. It was going to be like a couple weekend sort of thing, but then eventually we just loved the place so much that it became almost like every weekend that we were there. In the scene where McDuff escapes the jail and he bumps into a guard around the corner, uh, they tussle, and I'd been thinking about the stunt for probably over a year before we actually shot that, thinking about ways of how to put somebody in a headlock, maybe even two guys, put them in the headlock and run up a wall, and I was wondering if it's conceivable if they could get over and do a back loop. Three, two, one, go. We did at least 15 takes of that. That's how good we got at it. Uh, it was actually Matt Seguin, who was the guard. Put him in a headlock. All I did was run up the wall, push myself up as hard as I could, and Matt would just give me that extra boost with his hand on my back. Throws me over on my feet. That's one of the most commonly asked questions, is how did you do that with the wires? Like, how did you guys do that? And it's simple, run up a wall. <laughs> The stunts in the film were quite intense. Like from running up the wall, he was, you know, he was McDuff's main stunt double. I remember being there the day that he set himself on fire uh, on, on the bridge where you see McDuff throw somebody over the bridge. We hadn't been out filming in a long time. That day didn't really go very well. We tried to do explosions earlier that day, it didn't work out. So this day was do or die. We wanted to kickstart everything again. We go out, we're gonna do explosions today, and nothing worked. Words of advice, don't fucking do this at home. This is retarded, it's not gonna work. But we had to leave, we drove so far, we, had not, we hadn't filmed anything. Going into that day, I knew in the back of my head that if this doesn't work, then I'm probably gonna have to set myself on fire to save the day. So I was just like, Jeff, you should just like, you know, set yourself on fire and go over the bridge. And he's like, you're a genius. I'll do that in a second, right? He will do anything to get people going. As long as it is safe. He layered himself with wet clothes. He stuck a jacket over himself. He put a little sprinkled some gasoline on uh, the back of his jacket. And uh, you know, you see McDuff crawling up to him. He had a mask on, gloves on. Everything was safe. And uh, he got lit on fire. And then Je then uh, Dennis throws him over the bridge. So here I am thinking, I, have, I'm, I was on camera for this day. And here I'm thinking, oh, this is great. The scary part was, is that when he landed in the water, because of how many layers of clothing he had on, he couldn't really swim. Going into that, I knew that I was going to have to lose those layers of clothing as fast as I could when I hit the water. And they knew that they were going to have to jump in if there was trouble. So, I'm going over, and right when I hit the water, boom, take out the first layer. And then as I'm getting the second layer off, I realize that this river is pretty damn fast. And I'm holding the camera and I'm thinking, well, do I get the footage or do I put it down and jump in the, in the river? I was a little selfish, so I kept the camera going and Dennis eventually jumped in the, uh, after him. I managed to get the other layers of clothing off and get over to the shore. And there goes the jacket of fire. You see like people that are like, oh my god, my hands are like cut open or something. And they're like, okay, let's just keep going. I remember Jeff cut open his hands from swinging on that, those monkey bars. What an idiot. Jeff had this bright idea to jump off the build or jump off the roof. The thing is, we haven't even gotten the crash mat from the church yet, and he just freaking does it. So he lands and like snaps his leg. We had to go film. This was like a Friday. We had to go filming at the office like next Saturday. And uh, trooper that he was, he had like a broken leg, and he was still filming. He was in a wheelchair. I, this guy's just this guy's just crazy trooper. I mean, talk about dedication. You want to be dedicated to something? He's dedicated. <laughs> The best thing was being on, being at school at Brock, Brock U, film, and having Mike give me a message over MSN saying, Jeff, I have a crash mat. I just lost it. 
I lost it. We are so amazed because there's something Jeff wanted for a long time. My brother told my mom we got it from a, a gym, but that wasn't true. So, um, uh, we got it from a church, but I think they were throwing it out because it was beside their dumpster. Um, so we, we assumed they were throwing it out. So then we put it on the roof of our van, and um, we, we didn't tie it down because it was way too heavy. I told you I had to jump. <laughs> I don't poked do it, my don't ass. Do it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no! <laughs> <laughs> that crash mat came in so handy for all the stunts, jumping off his roof. Two, one. A lot of the stunts we did, we probably couldn't have done without that crash mat. Or at least without hurting ourselves. Oh. <laughs> now it's sitting in the back of my my backyard, all waterlogged. He can still have it if he wants. I'll take it, Mike. I'll take the crash mat. I'm going for the lawn. Looks <laughs> <laughs> like he's a coke addict. <laughs> <laughs> well, my favorite stunts in the movie, whether I did it or not, would have to be the 180 front, front flip over the fence with the saber, which Pete Benner did. He didn't want a mat, he didn't want us to shovel some snow around him, he didn't want anything. He's just like, I'm gonna do it. And he did it. I hit my foot on the tree branch. Except on one take, when he's going over the fence, there's a branch that's hanging down. And his feet clip the branch. Oh shit! <laughs> As he's falling, he if you watch it in slow motion, he smokes my shoulder and kind of turns a little bit, gets right up, does it like five more times. <laughs> Perfectly. Nice. Okay, we're done. I perform all of my own stunts. Got him. The worst injury I sustained was the injury to my heart. Did I hurt myself while filming this movie? Funny you should ask. No, I didn't. Why did I say funny you should ask? I'm satisfied with that answer. This will serve as protection when we try to step on you. <laughs> this is something I've been wanting to do for a long time. <laughs> last time we used ketchup, it sucks. Just play with ketchup. I mean, last time they buried you in the ground? <laughs> Welcome to my weekend. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I can do it. Here, let me, I could do it. Oh no, oh no, this is a different movie. Let's do a different movie. No, no. <laughs> I need help. <laughs> no, let's watch him. <laughs> is that your leg there, or? No, ah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Are you good? Oh, oh my god. Oh. You okay? Oh. You okay? Oh, pull the muscle. Oh. Oh my god! Oh, this hurts so much! Oh! Oh! Can you get it out? Oh! Oh dear god! It's like muscle for muscle work. Yeah, help cat! I like Bill. He says things funny. That man is an utter genius. Bill Stebbick, I met him the first day uh, that I was shooting, when they were shooting the car chase scene. Uh, he was on the ground eating grass and dirt. Uh, you know, uh, he introduced me himself as the Sand King, and then proceeded to tell me about the inner workings of time itself. He, uh, him and Dennis put together, when you put the two of them together, you know that funny things are just going to happen. It's, it's pretty much inevitable.
I, I was afraid of him. <laughs> he had the silentness to him, like, ooh, I cut you. They have that type of quietness. My worst memory of the movie was by far watching Dennis and Bill fight. What the hell was that? <laughs> Dennis can't hold a fist. He can't punch straight. He's all like this. It, oh, it was just sad. And then, to top things off, after I showed him how to do it properly, he goes and smokes Bill right in the face. Oh, the woman is, you're slapping a punch fist that is fist. No, look up, look up, get, get in the face. Dennis, fully extend the arm. You're not a lanky man. Dennis, like this, like, like this, like, this. like that, like that. That's it. That's it. That's more like it. Oh fuck! Oh sorry. Okay. Oh Jesus! Actually, Dennis Logan, that little sex kitten. Please don't use that. <laughs> What's brown and sticky? A brown stick. This guy's fucking a genius. Dennis is by far probably the funniest person that I know. He, uh, you never know what Dennis is gonna do, ever. Doesn't matter what day of the week or what state of mind he's in. There isn't even a word for him. He's just, Dennis is Dennis. Never really was one to be picked out of a crowd, but I picked him out, Dennis. Maybe he didn't hear what I just said. That's because I, uh, I made up a new word. I should never talk the truth when I'm on Disgusto. It ain't good. <laughs> I like Dennis though. He's a funny guy. He's the life of the party. He like, he, he does shit that's funny. I like him, but I like him. The only injury we, we had on the film, like that we actually call an injury, was a minor concussion which was sustained by Matthew Snowball on the first day of filming. What I like most about Matthew Snowball is his honesty. When I said, hey Matt, were you watching me sleep last night? He says, yeah, Bill, I was. And I appreciate that, I really respect that in a man. I don't think he said more than five phrases to me at one point in time, I, but I like him. You ever see him when he's like, um, does not wearing that hat? Because, um, it's, it's, it's a little scary under there. There's nothing that little guy can't do. Uh, Matt Snowball was an integral part of Macbeth 3000. He is in almost every second shot of the movie. Yeah, the first day of filming was the, uh, the three witches scene, which is the second scene in the movie, uh, filmed at the Food Basics. And what we actually did for that is, uh, we didn't really have... Well, let's just say I asked for permission and I hadn't received an answer. So anyway, we all wait, uh, the entire film crew, in these two vans at, at night, right? And then uh, as soon as the manager leaves at 5 o'clock, we all rush in with our track pieces, our lighting, our, our jibs, uh, the witches in costume, and we set up and just take over an entire aisle. And we're doing this one take where Matt has to have a bucket dropped on him from above. And uh, we had to drop the bucket on him a few times. We had tried padding it with... Uh, a few t-shirts on the inside duct taped and uh, uh, duct tape around the rim, kind of a foam. But the problem was the edges of it here uh, on the edge of the bucket, uh, they were still sharp. And uh, one time it dropped on his head, kind of went like that, swung around in him in the chin. And uh, he got a minor concussion. I didn't find out about it until like a few weeks, a month later. And I was just like, oh, oh. oh. Balls. Actually, balls. Actually, balls. Actually, Cut, cut, general. go again, go again. <laughs> When Matt met the bucket, I was called in to the film set uh, to drive him to the hospital in my Batmobile. That was me dropping the bucket. I'm so hey, Matt, if you're seeing this, I'm sorry for your concussion. It wasn't my fault. He's playing up this angle about how, oh, I got a concussion because I got hit in the head with a bucket on the first day of filming. Yeah, well, I got hit with a car, okay? Oh, shit. Are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? Yeah. Why are you all you? I'd have to say it's something I'm sure a lot of people in the movie wanted to do. I got to punch Jeff right in the face. 
We're at the end of the fight sequence. Harmeet's just arriving in the car with the dummy. And uh, that last punch just clips me in the, in the face. It, if it had been any closer, he would have busted my nose, but instead I just bled all over the costume. Um, but I kicked him in the face earlier that day, so kind of evened out. Okay, I have just been informed that apparently I was kicked in the head. Oh my god, that looks so real. Chris, show us your, yeah, that's your, the winner, the killer smile. <laughs> Hello. I remember getting kicked in the head that time. But that I was kind of expecting. Oh, he was good about getting me up, making sure it was okay. I got no beef with the guy. I'm not really big fans of that Jeff Meech guy. I fall off a, what was it, 12 foot ladder? I'd have to say, honestly, one of the f my favorite parts of the movie is when, after the first sequence, when we're all walking away from the big battle that happened at the facility, and we're walking away and Chad and I are talking, Everyone and it's like, oh, thank God nobody yeah, was hurt and all this stuff, and all of a sudden you see James as Super Dave fall in the background. It might not look that funny on camera, but if you were there for that filming... <laughs> I couldn't breathe for a good 10 minutes there. James, you okay? Cut. Cut. Is he okay? Is he okay? No, he's not. Oh my god. Knock the wind out of him. Knock the wind out of me? And what do you do? You're standing there trying to focus in on the shot to get a good shot. Oh, he was just making this weird noise. It was hilarious. You okay? You okay, James? James, you okay? Yeah, He's okay. Man, my arm just went underneath my ribs and knocked the air out of me. Okay, cool. Hard. Come on, just fucking knock yourself. Do two really good ones. Like, actually fucking hit your head, and then we'll be done with it. Yo, just hit your head on the tree. I was like, uh, all right. So then I did it, and it's like, no, 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 no. But you just hit it. Just hit it hard, and then I did it again. It's like, no, you just gotta do it hard. So I like, I just, I just did it, and I went as hard as I could, and that hurt. That I'm hurt sorry. a lot. <laughs> It looks like he's humping the tree. Yeah, that's because man sucks. That's it, right there. Ben Davis. Ben Davis. Ben Davis. Ben <laughs> Davis. What don't I think of Ben Davis? Ben is unique. He's a special guy. He's, uh, he's brilliant in his own way. Do you see the shirt here? This shirt right here? Do you know who gave me this shirt? It wasn't Ben Davis. Ben Davis, ah, good buddy. My old chum. We used to go out and get drunk in the Scottish Highlands. Until one day... And then, one day, Ben decided to turn into a monkey. Apparently, when Benji is yelling no, it cuts and it morphs into a monkey. I don't know why it was not put in the movie. And then he get, when he gets killed or when I die, that face. Oh, that was the worst. That was like the worst. He's all like, ah, bleh. You're looking at my camera. I wasn't looking at you. <laughs> he was a great guy, a great guy to work with. His role, he, he did his, he, you know, his character was brilliant. Apart from his, you know, accent changing every scene. Wait, I just, let me hear how I used to talk. He's trying to yell for one second about himself, and he can't do it. Like the moment. He's got some great grammar. I mean, he'll go places with English language he didn't even think was freaking possible. The final thoughts of today was that I think that we should have been done like two hours ago, and I think it was a little dragged out myself. But uh, all in all, it was a good day on the shoot. Shoot, I can't talk, talk. He's a great guy. But I mean, he's, he's such a klutz. None of us can get up to Kirsch to go, so we're like, do the little countdown thing, and uh, Bill and I hesitate. Jeff goes off, so I'm like, okay, screw it. I go off, Bill goes off. In the process of going down, I must have jumped off a little crooked because I was falling straight on top of Jeff. So Jeff hits the water, Ben hits the water. Ben lands on top of Jeff, our valiant director. You can't say anything, you can't talk, you can't move. I can't give him ideas. If you screw up your lines. But that never happened to me. Hey, you fucking piece of shit. <laughs> ben, say the line. Here's your lines. Say the lines. Okay, that's great. But what the hell does all this mean? 
Sometimes we had a script. Most of the time we didn't have a script. And when we had a script, we wouldn't use it. <laughs> there was many times when I had no idea what was going on. I don't understand what's going on. You might want to tell me what's going on. Fucking morons. Swear to God. You know what? I, I, I give it all up just because of that Ben character. You know, he's, 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 he's admirable, but the French people, he's... There are layers to Ben. Multiple, multiple layers. And uh, once you dig right into that Ben, once you get right in there, then uh, he's a real sweet guy. But I love Ben. Ben is absolutely amazing. He means well, and he's, uh, he's whole in his heart. But when it comes down to it, he just... He just can't put one foot in front of the other. Instead of running around a tree like I probably should have, I decided that I would jump over the tree. Oh, my and in doing so, I caught my leg and rolled my ankle and wasn't able to walk for about two, three days. It was pretty much everybody pointing cameras and laughing while I'm lying there in pain. But uh, I probably would have done the same thing if there was somebody else. <laughs> Chris Bourne. I've just been told we lost someone during the filming of this movie, though. Chris Bourne apparently has died. That ain't cool. That ain't cool. I think Chris's death came as a shock to all of us. And I was like, hey, just have another drink. Chris's death um, really was kind of weird. <laughs> His nipples exploded. Yeah, I'm just hearing recently that Chris Bourne died. I like, I'm hearing something about his nipples, and I don't know what's going on. I don't understand what's going on. It's really hit home, you know? Like every time I, I, I'm serious, man. If he hadn't have died so comically, it probably would have been something to mourn about. But I mean, we attached cherry bombs to his nipples for the, the climatic gun battle and they just went off. Boom, boom. What didn't make sense to me is why they were so tender before the explosion. One of the biggest regrets in my life was the inability to react in a, uh, Superhero Manor, and when uh, Chris Warren's nipples exploded, I froze up. It's just the same way my parents died. I've heard a lot of allegations, um, choking up ice cream, and then nipples exploding. I mean, like that does that does that honestly happen? And I mean, I'm willing to bet that he died from just just caring too much. Um, by that I mean smoking and drinking. He probably just got really drunk one day and fell over in a bus shelter. He'll be missed for sure. Chris was a good guy. Some things you can't get rid of, and um, some things you can't. And it turns out that Chris Bourne was one of those things, and uh, does that sound bad? You know what really sounds bad? The, the name Adrian on a man. I didn't die. If I'm gonna die, I don't want- Oh, shit! Who the hell is Chris Bourne? I mean, a full-fledged studio was built under my basement. Every day I came downstairs and some new gadget was there, and I said, oh my God, what the heck is this? What's going on? And the boys will be up till five, six in the morning, and I'll be sleeping, and then they'll be like passed out, and all this crazy equipment is lying downstairs. This is his basement, and it's midnight, and we're shooting the documentary, and they let us do things like this. We were 2004, the month of August. You're the reason we're drinking You tell this. that to anyone on the Super Gun crew and they'll know what you're talking about. That was one crazy month. Um, I drank a lot during that period. I had uh, anxiety attacks. Uh, yeah, it was horrible. We had to live in Harvey's basement for like a, all of August, basically, before we went back to school. And yeah, man, we were just like filming every other day, editing every day, and like lightsabers up the yin yang. And... Like the lightsaber scene, that was ridiculous. 
Because that shit is like, that's George Lucas shit. And they did it themselves, these kids from, like, in, in university now. Like, how? How, how are you just going to be so cool? Some of the effects that are in it, you see in, like, movies these days. Like, you see, like, lightsabers and, I mean, should I say light swords? Light swords in certain movies about wars in space. You know, with the energy swords, it was so much hard work. Like, you would sit there on the computer, you'd have to go frame by frame, and there's 30 frames in a second. Each frame, you'd have to go in and highlight the broomstick or whatever it is you're using as a prop for the light sword. About an hour's work, work uh, making lightsabers would equal maybe a second of footage, maybe just an hour and a half would equal one second of usable footage. I think it was actually less than that. Two, two and a half hours of work for like a second of film time. And the freaking battle was like 15 minutes. So I mean, God, you can know how fuck. Special effects, how they turned out in, in a whole. Um, I think it turned out really well. Things came together nicely. We wouldn't have headlight rockets. We wouldn't have the jets flying in the air. I mean, if we didn't have it, all the stuff that we did, all the stuff that I did, wouldn't have made any sense. The special effects, and when we say special effects, they're, they're, they're yeah, we made all the special effects in the movie, but they're not that bad. They're pretty good, just as a disclaimer. First of all, I, I'd never, when you guys said you were using green screen, I hadn't seen you, like, the outcome. So I didn't really know, like, pieces of, like, I guess it was a rod, and then on the, 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 uh, I think they were light poles. Using these speaker stands, which I found, and clamps, pretty much what, it's, it's we use the same thing that they use in, in photography backdrops and how they set them up. And they were just on there on a green screen and I had a backpack on. I was like, I don't know. I have a backpack on and there's fans blowing on me. I didn't know. I, I like I, I thought it would turn out, but not as good as it turned out. No, my nanny. Ah. Well, you know what's funny? She's actually related to your granny. So that's why we're so related. Hey. Oh, you okay? Injury. <laughs> we ended up just going to a regular fabric store. We paid seventy dollars for a sheet of green elastic fabric using uh, a program uh, effects homes chrominator jeff was able to edit uh, the green out of the shot and import any back background he wanted i think that more than creativity he, he brought in a determination and a and a um, and the ability to pay attention to detail and and get people to work in, in a manner which, when watching him direct was quite impressive because I also work in project environments where sometimes people need to be pushed or people need to be um, motivated. So watching Jeff articulate things and, um, and working through things in, in a great amount of, with a lot of attention to detail was very impressive. Excuse me, I am looking for directions to the morgue so I can eat some dead bodies. Do you know where the morgue is? I know where the morgue is. I will show you the morgue. So you may stick dead pieces of animals in your ass. Nice tie. Can I have directions to the dildo store? No dildo today. I am the bomb. I am the bomb. Do, 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 do. I am the bomb. Do, 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 do. He's he's a, he's a cool kid. Honestly, he is a very cool kid. He laughs like a schoolgirl, but he's a cool kid. I, I like him. That man knows how to get behind a camera. He can get behind anything. That man. He can get behind. <laughs> Jeff uh, Jeff kind of had a uh, split personality type deal with uh, the filming of the m movie. Away from the movie, he's the most like relaxed, easygoing guy I know. But as soon as the, he hits that record button, <laughs> yeah, he turns into like Hitler. He, uh, actually, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> Jeff comes out, gives me shit, hits me over the head with something, whatever he can find, and tells me we're not filming today, and sends me home. Jeff, uh, Jeff, he he's a good guy. I don't have anything more to say about that.
Now, I'd probably have to give most of my thanks out to him, though, because the amount of work he's putting in this film. He'll be, you know what? He's lived at my house for, like, the last two summers. And he'll literally go to bed at, like, 4 o'clock in the morning. He'll sleep on a beanbag, just sprawled out on my basement floor, wake up in the morning, crawl onto the chair, and go back to editing for the remainder of, like, the day. He'll probably eat, like, a meal, and that's it. He, he always brought me cookies. I felt bad one time because I spilled balls all over his work desk and I messed up a lot of stuff, but you do what you do. Living in Harmony's basement was, was hard to do because you're very malnourished. You don't get vitamin D from the sun. Uh, Bill's making wake-up juice, and you don't know what the hell's in it. Now, I'm not sure if you paid attention during science class, but if you... The water always boils at 100 degrees Celsius and then evaporates into the air, whatever was with the water stays behind. So if you make coffee, coffee is made with water, the grinds fall in, and they mix together, and then and you, got, you got the coffee there. So if you boil the water out, you get stronger coffee. Plus, as an additional bonus, what you can do is you can take instant coffee and then dissolve this into the coffee which you are boiling. Because this, because this coffee now is being boiled, it has much higher tolerance for, for stuff being dissolved into it. So you essentially become super saturated with, thing with coffee. Otherwise known as Bill's wake up juice. The wake up, no, this is just really strong coffee, which is an ingredient in the wake up juice. The audio, I thought it was great. The uh, the main song, the do 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 do. Anytime I'm somewhere with Jay and we're walking, we could be walking down the street, we could be walking in a crowded mall. We will yell that. We will yell it so loud, and it is funny. Do 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 do. Like that was, it was so ingenious. Like I I've been waiting forever to get a copy of it. And he just won't give it to me because he has to master it and remaster it and master the master of the master of it. But once he does it, I'm going to get a copy of it. I'm going to be pumping it in my car and shiz. Like the music, the opening music was absolutely amazing. I mean, I thought Steve Vi, I thought Steve Vai was working on it. It was Hamid Bindra. I love that guy. And he loves his cookies. The most uh, interesting experience I have ever had was meeting Harmeet Bindra for the first time. He was in his basement gouging his face full of cookies while playing the guitar on fire behind his back from his anus using a patch cord as a pick. The guy can do anything with his hands. He worked really hard on the soundtrack and it's really impressive really what he was able to pull off. It's like he's been doing it all his life. The soundtrack is fantastic. Sometimes I listen to it at night. What he did on his own, like, to make a soundtrack, that, that shit is crazy. You can't just do that. And he did. I was like, oh. But he did it. He was just, he, whoo. God damn. Well, and scoring the music, it was, it was really good. It was really well done. Um, I mean, I thought it would have taken a lot longer to score it, but I mean, we got it done really quickly. <laughs> It was his life, like he did, he would eat, sleep, breathe this movie. And there were, there were tough times on the set on filming this, but you could always count on Harmony to persevere, get the job done, and the soundtrack that he did was just unbelievable. And the amount of time he had, considering he had never done anything like this before. I quit, oh. Here we are at the theater where we're gonna be premiering back. Only three days. It's gonna be intense. The intensity of the effort he made after finishing school first year around early May through to July 15th. Uh, uh, to see my own son working practically 22 hour days and sometimes 24 hour days and then supported by Jeff and all the others to get the music done. To me it was a very emotional thing to watch that because I haven't seen that kind of work done even in my own field. Hello, hello, you're here.
we're here at the Macbeth 3000 preview screening, world premiere. Yeah. Hey. 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 Oh, hey. I'm so excited. If you could pick an emotion besides excited, what would it be? Horny. Right in your face. This is this the edge? Yep. So that's, that's me right there. Oh. On the edge. Oh, it's on the edge. You're over the edge there for a bit. On the edge. I was, it's close. It's shifty. It's fun. What are you going to do? Oh, my God. Vince Patel! JJ! They are Arendelle folks. They are not in the movie, but, oh, there's a lot of man love going on here. Yeah, yeah, so we show up and there's like like a few people scattered around and it was kind of nerve-wracking because you're like, are people actually going to be here? Are they going to show up? Are they going to, are we going to get any money out of them? Because that's what we're after, money. And uh, anyway, so then people started showing up. There's like 500 people outside, uh, you know, we're inside getting in our costumes, getting ready to ticket take. These are people we've never seen before. People out of the blue coming in just off the street. Curiosity, what is Macbeth 3000? Yeah, no, no, we need to find there? a phone booth. Okay, okay. right now, it's Clark Kent. Clark Kent dressed up as Superman. So, so, so I walk by, and then, and then someone says, "Hey, Clark Kent." Exactly. But watch this. Oh my God! Oh. Superman. <laughs> Superman. No, Clark Kent. What's wrong Clark with you? Kent. Where did now you it's Clark Kent. Where did you? <laughs> <laughs> I've been to a lot of movie premieres, and I've never seen a crowd as uh, dedicated and stout-worthy as the Macbeth 3000 audience. They're a good bunch, and I'd, uh, I'd drink with them any day. Bigger turnout than I ever thought that would be there. My adrenaline was gone. It was just too much. Ooh, it was... It was a hell of a time. <laughs> I am so excited. I've been waiting exactly three years, 27 days, and six minutes to see this. Oh, crap. I'm finally going to see the movie that I spent time to actually be in. Like, these people made it and shit. Jason Lofman, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's pretty funny, I guess. I mean, he's black and... <laughs> So it's gotta be goddamn black people. Gangsters. <laughs> God, that guy makes me uncomfortable. Now, I'm gonna tell you something don't bone about me. I smoke rock. Selling tickets, people going in, and not knowing 100% if this movie is gonna work, if there's not any problems with the DVD. The DVD we showed, we hadn't watched yet. We didn't know if there was any scratches or any drop frames or anything wrong with it. It was the most nerve-wracking day. You know, during the day we had so much to do. I was still burning the movie that was going to be played that day, that night, at the premiere. But it all paid off in the end, and the outcome of the premiere was something I'll never forget. Are you going? Are you going? Are you guys starting? Bill, answer me, damn you. Yes. Starting? Okay. Maybe. Walking through those curtains onto the stage with the spotlight in your face and 500 people just, just clapping, yelling your name, saying, oh, it would, I can't compare it to anything. Thank you all for coming out. Just to tell you what this is, Macbeth 3000 is a modern Shakespearean adaptation, put to the tune of a Bond movie and with lots of inappropriate jokes in it. No. Some jokes may be offensive. <laughs> we'll let you decide. <laughs> We've got your money, we don't care. <laughs> Have a good evening. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Beth in the, uh, the movie here, but 
to see. And um, really, we just thought we should say something. This, the movie's called This Time is Personal because really for us, it, it is personal. It's made with all of our friends. I'd say nine, they make up 90% of the audience at this point. And uh, we just were really, really glad you could all come out. So you should really give yourself a round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you for so much. I never saw this day coming, but it's, it's a dream come true, and I, what a better theater to premiere in here than here. Thank you for coming out, and I hope you enjoy the show. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'd just like to say that uh, no one was hurt during the filming of this program, but uh, except, except, except for, except him for him. me, who had a mild concussion, but um, I don't really remember when that happened in this thing, so it'll be news to me. All right, so guys, enjoy the show. <laughs> Once we sat in the audience and everything, we were all, it was like one heart attack after another. Every time Banquo got on that screen, I was like, ah. Oh, I, I didn't really like the movie that much. Uh, you know, uh, too many uh, explosions and stuff like that. I'm a, I'm a peaceful, loving man. I like quiet movies about, with, uh, with plots and drama. I was really nervous. I was uh, hoping that I didn't look like an ass. After watching it, I see that I had a little problem with the keeping the same voice. But I don't know, that's a little character. At the time, watching it, the acting looked terrible. And you know, all, all the stuff looked really bad, but I mean, on screen, when we got, we got it all done, it looked amazing, you know? Um, it was really, really good to see how well it all came together. When I first saw it, it was just the effects and everything, with the music, everything that synced in together, it just looked great, and I was just so glad to be a part of it. I, I think the premiere went well. Um, we uh, we went up on stage and uh, we said some stuff and uh, we got really drunk after. They cannot see you right now because hey, shut up! How's it feel to be done? Huh? How's it feel to be done? Thank you. Sorry, feel dumb? How does it feel to be done? Dumb? How does it feel to be dumb? I don't understand your question. I'm too dumb. Okay. We're done? I said dumb. We're done. Dumb. We're done. Done? You're done. But then at the after party, everybody came in, expressed what they thought of the movie. This kid is just amazing. I'm so proud of him. I love him. And he did a great job. Thanks very much, guys. It was excellent. Everybody loved it. Everybody was in high spirits. Snowball was a little drunk. But the after party, after party, that was really cool. I think I was on my A game there. And whatever I gotta say, I gotta say what I gotta say, and what I gotta say is there's nothing much. Seeing him drunk is just inspiration. <laughs> Makes you wanna drink. <laughs> All right, go on. So I was talking to Ralph, I says, I says, Ralph, I says, Ralph, you know, my wife, she doesn't make orange juice very well. And Ralph's like, Ralph. Ralph is like, dude, I I didn't even know you had a wife. And then I was like, to Ralph, I was like, wife, I'm not even married. I don't remember the evening, but um, from what I from what I'm told, it, you know, it, I I've seen some footage, and um, and uh, I woke up and uh, I was told I was wearing that uh, after, so so I put it on after. That's the only explanation, and. Uh, we we found we we we've we've found my wallet, so that's the important thing. Hello. Excuse me, sir. What, what did you think of the movie? <laughs> it was awesome. It was honestly drawing. <laughs> <laughs> that was what the movie was, basically. It was wild. It was good. It was. Uh, <laughs> It was good one. <laughs> what are we after? I thought it was psychologically taut and emotionally stirring. Very good. Yeah? Very slow worth the money. All right, you guys, over the weeks we've been showing you some of the hottest trailers from the Young Cuts film competition. But today, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to show you the winning trailer. So don't miss it. It's all happening at 969. The trailers these guys put out are absolutely amazing. Best trailer. Make that tree. <laughs> Right.
great friends with them. Never do that again. And this is just a symbol of what people can do when you work together, bond together as great united people. <laughs> I just want to give the uh, production team, my boys, a great thank you for letting me come and say a few words um, about this movie. I'm, I'm, a, I'm very proud of the accomplishment uh, that's happened with Macbeth 3000. It's been a pain, believe you me. Uh, super against cinema. I love the logo. That's for one thing. As for the guys in it, uh... Yeah, they're a bunch of dicks. No, it's just... No, they're great. I don't, I don't think I've ever had a worse memory with these people. Except for this, this is really disgusting. The kind of shit that these kids pulled together and, uh, you know, did. I think everybody that I talked to about the film, everybody's like, yeah, that was, like, amazing for just, like, a group of guys just saying, hey, let's film a movie. Let's eat some cookies. But, you know, they've really got a professional side to them. My nit is Matthew Snowball, I rub my nipples, and then Chris dies when his big nipples went flying high, uh -huh. and we use them as freaking hub cups. Hub cups? What are hub cups? <laughs> no, you're drunk. Let me put it this way. Most movies you have slates, you have... You have everything very organized. You have, you have a time code, you have things like that. With what we did with Macbeth, I think we kind of put like guerrilla filmmaking to like a whole new level of just getting in there, getting a shot, doing it for like no money. It's just showing what you can do with like just an imagination. Me and my friends, we like to film movies too. So it's like more of like we look up to like what you guys have done. Yeah, I think like probably a lot of kids would look up to that and say, wow, like, you know, they did that with like no money basically. Or like, you know, how they make those things. And we go and tell them. They're like, holy cow, like, that's something I could do, basically, even though you shouldn't. Now I know how hard it is to make a movie of this caliber. And I mean, without the people, you won't have your movie. Everybody put a lot of effort into it. And I mean, I think I've got a piece of myself in the movie. Oh, shit! I think everybody was part of it. It was a lot of fun, and I just, I'm glad that I had a chance to be a part of the whole movie. You have to learn things, you have to adapt, and everybody evolved so quickly in their skills and their talents. It's just remarkable. That's why this was the best learning experience in my life. More than money, more than fame, more than anything out of this movie, the experience we got is something I'll never, ever let go. These things, these are things to be remembered, to be cherished, and some other adjective. I'm glad, I'm glad you guys do what you do. Also, I'd like to say on my behalf, thank you to Supergun Cinema for having me. This may be my big movie break. Who knows? Who knows? But good luck to wherever you go. I know you guys can go far. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure you guys will go far. That's as far as we got, but that's as far as we need to go. What is important is a camaraderie. Here, look my finger. <laughs> I don't think I'd ever work with the Supergun team again unless they supply me with a couple more bottles of alcohol and uh, maybe pay me this time. But, uh, you know, they're a good bunch of lads. Maybe a little, uh... Wait. Do you know what a blumpkin is? No one would even think of that. It just doesn't work. But apparently it does. Hopefully they reap the reward. Reap. Hopefully they... <laughs> Sorry. Hopefully they reap the rewards that they probably most likely deserve. Probably most likely. <laughs> <laughs> my second time bad it. <laughs> I don't know, you might not think that one's a joke, because it's not. Brock you for life, gangsters.
but I can tell you one thing, it's gonna be great. You're gonna look on the TV and you're gonna see me be like, it's Laughman. I love that guy. It's Laughman. This is Laughman, bye bye, bitch. <laughs> Nigga, please. But I think that the bond that they built of trust between them carried them through. So it's very, very impressive that, uh, uh, you know, they can create such a fantastic result. All I can say is Hollywood, watch out, right? Because Super Gun Cinema is going to take you one. Thanks very much. All the best. That, that role allowed me to show my emotions in a, in a way that no other man has ever shown his emotions before, sexually. But SWAT was an experience I'll never forget. My future will be spent doing a lot of things. Things of a secretive nature. Things so deadly and sexy that you don't even need to know how deadly and sexy they are to know that they'll be damn deadly and Boys damn and sexy. Are some sexy. Boys in tight clothes are some sexy. Boys in tight clothes are some sexy. It's, it's amazing how much you can learn by working at something that drives you. Five years to see myself sitting in this chair again, talking about Caesar in space. That or I'll be congratulating Ben on his mission to the moon. So when do you want to start the interview? Boys in tight clothes are some sexy. Boys in tight clothes are some sexy. Boys in tight clothes are some sexy. Yeah, I may have ruined my clutch on the March break, and yeah, maybe, you know, Chris Bourne had a couple chipped teeth, and yeah, he died, but I mean, I'd do it all again. It was great. As long as I don't die. Boys in tight clothes are some sexy. Fuck, whatever. I'm not dead. I'm fucking sitting here drinking a beer, talking to you about how, you know, I didn't die.
speak. What was that? Oh, uh, yeah, now I'll be able to really speak. Tell the truth about you guys. What a pain in the ass you've been for the last three years. Hmm? <laughs> Don't you record that? <laughs> I don't understand what's going on. That's because you're not thinking hard enough, stupid. <laughs>